Okay, thank you very much. Fab. So welcome again to everybody. This is um, a webinar by the Faculty of Public Health Special Interest Group for Primary Care and Public Health, which is a bit of a mouthful, and we haven't come up with a, with a good acronym for it. Um, there are many special interest groups in the Faculty of Public Health, but this one was um, established in 2018 to provide a forum for public health clinicians, general practitioners, academics, and really anyone who's got an interest in primary care and public health collaboration to come together. So you, um, anyone who's a member of the Faculty of Public Health can join the special interest group. You can even be an associate member for a bargain, £82 a month. So anybody who's joined here who's not yet a member of the SIG and is interested, uh, again, I've put um, a, a link in the chat on how to join. But uh, for 80, <laughs> 82 pounds a month, you yeah. not only do you get to join the SIG, but you get a, a lot of um, information and updates from the Faculty of Public Health. So that's good if you have an interest in public health population health. Um, the webinar series like this is open to anybody. Um, so feel free, you know, if you if you know about any of our webinars to pass them on through your networks and all our previous ones. I think we're, we've got a dozen or so now on really interesting topics are all there uh, on our web page that, that you can see. Um, they've so far been organised by Johnny Curry, who is one of our uh, active members, who is um, a GP who's also uh, coming to the end of his public health training. So his dual, uh, we'll have dual registration soon. Myself and Eleanor, who I see is joined here, are the co-chairs. Um, both of us are uh, either dual registered in general practice and public health or on the way there. Um, Eleanor's at the beginning and I'm at the end of, of um, Kachurni. Um, so there's a lot of people in the group who kind of have a, a work in one area and have a, a role or a special interest uh, in the other. And now I'm delighted that Lizzie Emsley, who's a GP in Bristol, has taken on the lead for organising um, the webinar series. And she's uh, got a great speaker for her, her first one. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's somebody that I, I thoroughly admire, admire her work, um, and she's a great communicator. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from her. So Lizzie, I will hand over to you to introduce the webinar. Hello there everyone, yeah it's great to meet you all um, and I'm also a member of the special interest group and it is a real privilege to be able to introduce Dr Fe Bex Fisher today who will be speaking about the inverse care law in general practice. Bex is a GP and a senior policy fellow at the Health Foundation and Bex is also co-founder of Next Generation GP and she is a um, 2022 to 2023 UK Harkness Fellow um, in healthcare policy and practice. And she is joining us all the way from San, Fran from San Francisco today. So it's absolutely it's such a delight that you can join today. It's wonderful. And thank you very much for coming along. So just handing over to Bex now. Lizzie, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to those who have joined today. Um, I'm really aware that you guys are a very expert audience. Um, and what I intend to do with you today is convince you of three things, but I think probably some of you know these already. Um, the first is that the provision of general practice in England is inequitable. The second is that I don't think we will successfully tackle health inequalities unless we level it up. And the third is that levelling up is possible, but it requires political will that isn't currently there. I'm going to do that over the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A and a bit of a discussion. And I'm going to do it by talking very generally to begin with about health inequalities. I'm not going to do that for long because I think you are fully versed in the background to this. Then we're going to zoom out a bit and talk about the kind of 30,000 foot view of general practice. And the reason that I think that's important is because a lot of this intersects at the world of practice, policy and politics. And so whatever the political wind is of the day affects the policy um, what is possible in policy land and therefore what happens to us in practice. We're going to talk about one of my heroes, Julian Tudor Hart and the inverse care law. Then I'm going to go on to use Health Foundation data to show you that the, the provision of general practice in England is inequitable. We'll talk about why that is and what we can do about it. Just a couple of disclaimers to begin with. The first is that I'm going to present to you a bunch of slides today, um, a bunch of uh, graphs that represent work that certainly isn't entirely mine. Um, it's done by a cast of very, very able characters at the Health Foundation um, and credit is theirs. And where credit isn't, 
ours at the foundation, I will be clear about where I have pilfered slides from my colleagues um, at the King's Fund um, and a couple of other sources. So it's not all my work um, and I will try and be clear to you about where I have pilfered things from um, when I have. Firstly, why should I care? Now, I think probably you will care um, because you are the Faculty of Public Health and you are on this call. And I think probably you're aware of these things, but let me just be clear so that we're all starting from the same background, which is pretty grim. So since 2010, healthy life expectancy in England has stalled. That hasn't happened since 1900. And that's largely because inequalities in life expectancy have increased. So for men, there's almost a 10 year gap in life expectancy between the most and least deprived areas. For women, it's 7.6 years. And the gap in healthy life expectancy, the number of years of life that you can expect to live in good health, has in, is even wider. So um, it's almost 20 years for women and 18 and a half years for men. So pretty dire. And as I know that you know, that gap in life expectancy isn't all amenable to healthcare. In fact, probably only a small proportion, people quote different numbers, don't they? It's you know, often somewhere between 10 and 20%. But a small proportion of that gap in life expectancy is amenable to intervention by healthcare. And a lot of it lies out of at least the direct remit of healthcare, though I think those lines are becoming more blurred, um, but lies in the social determinants of health, the conditions in which we were born, we grow, we work, we play. Um, that play such a massive role in um, affecting our life expectancy. So clearly a lot of action on this has to come from action on the social determinants of health, but that 10 to 20%, however precisely much it is, is really important, can make a big difference. And we also have very good evidence to guide us as to how healthcare can affect health, health inequalities and inequalities. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Most of you guys will be familiar with this. This is just another way of visualizing that gap. Focus, if you will, for a second on the red line through the middle. You'll have realized by now this is the tube map of London or at least part of it. And this is the central line running through. So if you happen to live at Tottenham Court Road, you can expect to live a pretty whopping 96 years, um, but move through. And by the time you're at Bow Road, that's Google tells me 5.3 miles down the road, you're at 77. So pretty um, drastic way of visualizing it. And this is where I work in Oxford, at least the picture on the right of your screen is. So um, on the left, we have Parktown in leafy North Oxford. It's about 20 minutes if I pedal quickly up to Blackbird Lees where I work, which is an area of social housing kind of outside the ring road of the city. It was actually built to provide workers for what was then the Mini, the Morris Minor plant, then Mini, now BMW. Um, and in Blackbird Lees, you can expect to live about seven and a half years less um, than if you live in Parktown, 20 minute cycle ride away. So I think probably all of you care about this because you probably feel, as I do, that this is unfair and it's unjust. And it's also something that we can do something about. Before I move on to talk to you specifically about what we are and aren't doing about it in general practice, I want to just clarify the language I'm using, because I'm going to be using the term inequity a lot as I talk in the, through the next few slides. Um, and it's a, just a very quick reminder of the difference between equity and equality. Equality meaning that each individual or group get the same resources or opportunities and equity recognizing that each person has different circumstances. So allocating the exact resources and opportunities they need to reach an equal outcome. So my preference is always to talk about equity and inequity um, because I think that is much more useful than talking about equality and inequality. I'm just going to zoom out for a second and talk about the state of general practice because as I said a moment ago it's important to put this within its kind of overall public and political paradigm and I think you all know the state of general practice at the moment is pretty perilous. Um, this graph shows you the trend in appointments in general practice over the last few years. It's all wibbly because of the COVID lockdowns. Um, and because of the way we've scaled it, actually, it probably doesn't look as dramatic as I think it actually is. Because the number of appointments that general practice is doing, the volume of appointments, is going up pretty drastically. So there were almost 30 million appointments in general practice. That's not specifically appointments with a GP, but appointments in the whole of GP services um, in January this year. That's four million more 
than in January 2022. So that's about a 15 percent increase. Now, you may well say, well, that's fine. And it would be fine if our resourcing was proportionate to that increase. But it's not. So this is a graph actually from a recent Health Select Committee, uh, sorry, recent House of Commons Library report, but you'll see theme and variation on it everywhere. Um, and it shows you what's happening to GP numbers. And I just want to be clear for a second here about language, because you will hear different groups saying different things about GP numbers, and it depends on how you interpret the different groups of possible GPs. So the line at the bottom of this graph, so you're looking at time over the x-axis and GP numbers on the y-axis, the purple line at the bottom is GPs in training grade. Now, as you all know, in 2015, the government committed in their manifesto to 5,000 more GPs by the end of that parliament, in, which in theory would have been 2020. By 2019, despite having clearly not got anywhere need, need, near meeting that pledge, the Conservative Party manifesto for the December 2019 election promised 6,000 more GPs uh, by 2024. And we are clearly nowhere near that. But what you can see on the line in purple at the bottom is that the number of GPs in training roles is increasing, which is great. There are significantly more GP trainees now than there were five years ago. Wonderful. And so when you hear government push back against things about GP numbers, they will say the number of GPs is growing. I would personally take slight issue with that because what they're doing is they are including GP trainees in that number. And many of you I know will have been medically trained. Those who aren't are probably familiar with medical training. But GPs who are in training are fully qualified doctors, but they will often have longer appointments. They will have more supervision from a fully qualified GP who is also additionally qualified as a GP trainer. So my preference would be that when we talk about GPs, we're talking about fully qualified permanent GPs and preferably full-time equivalent, because actually what is happening is that those increasing number of doctors in training aren't translating into increased participation in the workforce. So folk are cutting back their hours, older GPs are retiring from the service entirely at, at higher rates, and so what we see is a decrease in the number of permanent fully qualified GPs. So we've got about 2,075 fewer fully qualified GPs compared to the September 2015 baseline. So hopefully what I've just done is showing you we've got this big increase in appointment volume, which translates into an increase in workload in all sorts of different ways. And we actually have a decrease or at very, very best case, if, if you were kind of creative with the language, a plateauing um, of, of doctors in general practice. And the reason I want to talk about this is because it's important to understand that nowhere is having it easy in general practice at the moment. I'm going to talk to you about why general practice in deprived areas is having it so hard. But when we come back to talk about why it's difficult to do anything about it, it's important to remember that nowhere is having it easy. And this graph just shows you the gap between primary and secondary care. So this is from John Appleby at the Nuffield Trust. And he's just showing that the number of hospital consultants represented in the purple line has gone pretty steadily up um, since the early 2000s and the number of GPs went up for a short period, plateaued in the kind of mid noughties and has been decreasing ever since. So kind of important, I think, overall context. Let's talk now specifically, though, about the inverse care law. Quite a few of you might recognise this chap, it's Julian Tudor Hart, who was a Welsh GP who died in 2018. And he worked for almost all of his career in a very deprived mining community in the Welsh Valleys. I think he turned down a series of very eminent professorial chairs to stay working in his local practice. He was the first doctor to routinely measure every patient's blood pressure. As a result, he was able to reduce premature mortality in high risk patients in his practice by I think it was something like 30%. You know, very, very impressive. And this was, of course, before mass computerization. He had a system of um, little filing cards that he used. His practice was the first to be used by the MRC as a research practice. Um, and he was also the author of the 1971 Lancet paper on the inverse care law. Um, in which he argued that the availability of good medical care varies inversely with the need for it in the population served. And what he actually went on to say, that's that's the bit we all learn at med school, right? The bit he actually went on to say 
is that the inverse care law operates more completely where medical care is most exposed to market forces and less so where such exposure is reduced. The market distribution of medical care, he says, is a primitive and historically outdated social form, and any return to it would further exaggerate the maldistribution of medical resources. Um, and I'm rather cheekily flicking that up, partly because I like it, but also just to um, commend to you that anyone who hasn't read that paper but is interested in this stuff, I would really suggest that you do it. It's a, a absolutely cracking paper. And what I'm going to do now um, is spend some time looking at to what extent this inverse care law persists in England now. I am keeping this to England. That's because a lot of the data that we use for this is data from NHS Digital, so it pertains to England only. Um, you will know from the work of, for example, the DPEN group in Scotland, that inverse care laws exist in other parts of the UK as well. But just to be clear, the data I'm about to share with you is all from the NHS in England. And the first thing we're going to look at is where the need for healthcare is equally distributed across the country. Now, I think you all know that the answer to this is no, but it's important to understand the degree of the difference because then we understand how equitable or inequitable our resourcing of general practice is. So these are again slides done by Health Foundation colleagues. Um, this first one looks at the percentage of patients with two or more long-term illnesses by IMD score, so index of multiple deprivations, a composite um, index allowing us to apply an ag aggregate socioeconomic deprivation score to a geographical area. And what you're looking at here is different colours representing different age groups, purple younger folk, red 50 to 70, and the green is the 70 plus, so as you would expect, people are more likely to have multiple health conditions as they get older. But if you look from left to right, as we go from richer areas in, so that's decile one, to the poorest areas, decile 10, the number of people or proportion of patients who are living with multiple health conditions increases at each age group. So in the most deprived areas, people can expect to have two or more health conditions by the time they're 61, but in the most affluent areas, it's 71. And almost one in three adults in the most deprived areas have four or more health conditions compared with just 16% in the least deprived areas. If we break that down a little bit and look at what health conditions people have and what the trajectories are for those, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time here, but I just want to point out one or two things. The first is that you can see for both younger people represented in the graph on the left and older people represented on the graph on the right, the prevalence of chronic illness by age group rises as you go from richer areas to poorer areas. And that's what you would expect. So asthma, depression, coronary heart disease, diabetes, all more common in poorer areas than in richer areas. And the exception to that is this black dotted line, which is cancer. And I just draw, wanted to draw your attention to this because it's pretty grim and it comes back to the why should, why should I care point. Um, and when you first look at this, you, you may feel slightly surprised. This is a black line representing cancer. And what we're saying is, well, the prevalence of chronic illness is decreasing. The prevalence of cancer is actually higher in richer areas than poorer areas. But if you think about that for just a moment, you'll realize why. And it is very sadly that people who have cancer don't live as long in poorer areas as in richer areas. So this is not a graph of incidence, the number of new cases. This is a graph of prevalence, the number of cases existing in a population. And what happens is that a lot of the cancers that are more common in poorer areas, classically the smoking related cancers, things like lung cancer, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, cancers that are associated with poorer outcomes mean that the overall prevalence of cancer is lower in poorer areas. And this graph shows consultation rates in general practice. So the number of times a person will consult um, with their surgery in a year, it's pretty wobbly because it, it represents a pandemic time period. But I don't want you to look at the detail. I just want you to look at the pattern, because remember, what we're thinking about here is fundamentally is demand for general practice the same across the country. And here you can see that the red line at the top represents the poorest 10% of areas. The blue line at the bottom represents the richest 10% of areas. And it's quite a gap in consultation rate. So in the richest 10% of areas, people will consult an average of four and a half times a year. I know nobody really has half a consultation, but this is an average. It's more like six times a year in the poorest areas. So just to kind of 
step back and illustrate in basic terms what that means. If you're a practice in the poorest 10% of areas and you've got, let's say, 10,000 people on your books, they'll generate about 60,000 appointments per year. If you're a practice in the richest 10% of areas with the same number of patients, 10,000, those patients are going to generate about 45,000 appointments a year. And that's quite a big gap. That's about 29% more appointments for the same number of patients in the deprived area. Clearly, that's a very crude example. We haven't factored in lots of other factors which affect consultation rates. But it's important to understand that socioeconomic deprivation is an important predictor of consultation rates in general practice. So it's entirely reasonable to think, well, OK, consultation rates are higher, health needs are higher. But if general practice is available in proportion to that need, then we haven't got a problem. And you'd be right. So what I'm going to do now is talk about whether the availability of general practice is proportionate to need. And this first graph looks at payments to general practice. So remember, general practices are in essence small businesses. This is not GP pay. This is not the amount of money GPs go home with. This is payments to the practice to, to run the practice, to pay the staff um, and, you know, and fulfill all of, the all of the practice contractual obligations. And what we would expect, logically, is that because there is more need and more demand for general practice in poorer areas, that practices in poorer areas would have higher total practice payments. All I want you to focus on for the next couple of slides is the colours in the graph because the coding is, is the key. So what we have here is green at the top is the least deprived areas and red at the bottom is the most deprived areas. Now, what we would expect to see is that red is at the top, i.e. Practices in the poorest areas get the most money. What we in fact see is the complete inverse of that, and that practices in the most deprived areas, the red line, get the least money. Practices in the most affluent areas, the green line, get, get more funding. And if you put that into neater words, once you wait for need, practices serving more deprived populations get about 7% less funding per weighted registered patient than practices serving more affluent populations. How does that translate into workforce? Well, the graph at the top here shows you GP workforce. So let's focus on that for just a second. And again, I just want you to look at the patterns and you've picked it up already, I suspect, which is that the relationship is the opposite of what you would expect or want, i.e. GP numbers are highest in the most affluent areas and lowest in the most deprived areas, green at the top, red at the bottom. Um, again, when you account for different levels of need, a GP working in a practice serving the most deprived patients will on average be responsible for the care of 10% more patients than a GP serving the most affluent areas. Interestingly, we see the reverse pattern for nurses. So red line at the top here. And we don't really know why that is. We don't know whether it's a substitution effect. Um, um, we're un unsure what drives that. Something that does worry me particularly is that there are a disproportionate number of older GPs aged over 65 working in the most deprived areas. And that's clearly a concern because as those people leave the workforce, if they're not being replaced, this is just going to get worse and worse. This graph, and sorry, this is different color coding because we published this somewhere else, looks at how long people get in a consultation by uh, IMD group. And what we see is that whether or not some, so people who have multiple health conditions get slightly longer in each GP consultation. So far, so good. That makes sense. But at all levels of multimorbidity, people who are poorer or who live in more socioeconomically deprived areas, I should say, get a shorter time in a GP consultation. So the greater health needs of people living in more deprived areas aren't reflected in longer consultation lengths. And then this is probably unsurprising, but practices in the most de deprived areas have a greater risk of high turnover of GPs compared to practices in the least deprived areas. Um, and they have turnover rates that are almost 10% higher than practices in affluent areas. And obviously that's a worry for a range of reasons. High turnover is probably not a good thing for any employer, um, but particularly in the context of general practice, it affects continuity of care. Um, we know that often patients don't like it, very much, certainly where I work, you know, you get a lot of people 
commenting about how many GPs have come and gone and who they miss. And, you know, that's difficult for everybody. There's also large financial costs associated with high turnover. There's impact on morale. There's impact on quality of care, so on and so forth. So unsurprising that GP turnover is higher in more deprived areas, but not a good thing. So compared to more affluent areas, general practice in areas of high deprivation has greater population health need, has higher consultation rates, it gets less funding, it has fewer GPs and shorter GP consults. And I'm not going to show you the data for this because I don't want to completely bombard you with graphs. Um, but GP practices in deprived areas also perform worse on all three major quality indicators. Um, and look, clearly, these are to a certain extent slightly blunt markers of quality, but they are nonetheless the national markers of quality that we have. So GP practices in more deprived areas do worse on the COF. Um, that's the pay for performance component of GP pay. They are more likely to not perform well on CQC inspections and they get lower overall ratings from patients on the GP patient survey, both for access and for overall experience. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that the provision in general of general practice in England is inequitable. Why will we not successfully tackle health inequalities unless we level it up? Well, I think you're probably all familiar with the concept of proportionate universalism. You'll have read some of Michael Marmot's work or seen him talk. Um, and this is the idea that the resourcing and delivery of universal services needs to be at a scale and intensity proportion to the degree of need. And I think, you know, the premise of the argument here is pretty straightforward. We know that effective general practice can improve population health. We know that in terms of reducing health inequalities, there's particularly strong evidence around um, in secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, things like controlling high blood pressure, diabetes, etc. At the moment, we effectively have more general practice, greater supply in richer areas, which is ironically where there's less need. But what that means is that people who are living in those areas, um, in richer areas, are likely to get better access and treatment. So health inequalities will widen. And if you put in a well-intentioned intervention, um, unless you do something about the provision of the intervention, you're just likely to widen health inequalities further. And you, you will be aware of the examples of screening programs, which, although clearly great things, often do widen health inequalities because they're disproportionately taken up by some populations over others. So I don't think that we successfully tackle health inequalities until we level up general practice. There's lots of stuff that we can do and it will make some difference, but leveling up general the provision of general practice to me at least seems a pretty fundamental part of tackling health inequalities. So finally, let's talk about how we can level up. And I want to talk about the sorry story of the Carhill formula, which requires us for a couple of minutes talking about how general practice is paid. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this. GPs are essentially paid per weighted patient. So they get a sum of money for each patient on their practice list. And there is a weighting applied to that for a bunch of factors that are meant to account for the workload associated with looking after that patient. It's called the Carhill formula, confusingly also called the global sum formula. And there's a bunch of factors that make up that weighting, things like the patient age and sex, there's a market forces factor for the cost of employing staff in that area, there's a bump up for rurality, there's something for list turnover. And there's a marker of additional patient need, we actually use the standardised mortality ratio for our under 65s, but there's no specific marker of deprivation in the weighting for Car Hill. Um, and that is a big, big problem. And there was a study done a few years ago by a team at the University of Leicester, which showed that for each 10% increase in IMD score, practice payments increased by just 0.06%. And this formula was brought in in 2004 in the sweeping changes to the GP contract that were introduced then. Prior to that, general practice had a series of what were called deprivation payments. They were effectively top up payments for practices in deprived areas to account for the additional cost of meeting the need of that population. Those deprivation payments got removed when Carhill was introduced because the idea was that Carhill would do it all in its waiting. But it was pretty clear from fairly early on that it wasn't doing that. And so in 2007, government commissioned a formula review group to look at it. And the formula review group came back and they said very explicitly that 
Carhill doesn't do enough to wait for deprivation. And so practices in deprived areas are being underfunded. And they recommended that IMD be put in as a waiting factor. And that, in fact, went to a vote of the profession in 2008. And the profession said no. Um, and we will come back to that in just a second. But this problem gets multiplied because on every other income stream into general practice, or almost every other income stream, things like premises are slightly different. But for outcome-based payments, for activity-based payments like immunizations, and for specific extra initiatives um, that practices can earn a bit more money for, so this might be things these vary locally, but it might be something like fitting coils or implants. Um, on all of those payments, practices in poorer areas do less well. So you get this kind of cumulative effect. The global sum accounts for just over 50% of practice income, that skews against practices in poorer areas. And then on almost all of these other income streams, certainly the big ones, practices in poorer areas also do less well. Um, so this isn't a problem just created by Carhill, but Carhill is a big part of creating the problem. And as I mentioned, this is not new news. Like we have known about this for some time. A change was recommended shortly after the formula was introduced, but that change was rejected by the profession. And this sort of comes back to um, the point I was making earlier on about the 30,000 foot view of general practice. This is me this time last year, giving evidence to the Health Select Committee's inquiry on the future of general practice. And I had the opportunity to speak about Carhill um, and told them pretty much as I have told you today, a slightly more condensed version, um, why I think it has to go. And this is their report, which pleasingly echoes that. So they say the government and NHS England must develop a better mechanism to award funding to more deprived areas to replace the Carhill formula, which is insufficiently weighted for deprivation at present. The funding chain should be used to support further work to ensure equal access to general practice across the country. So far, so good. But we were there in 2007 with the formula review group. We were there with the GP forward view in 2016, which also suggested changing Carhill. We are back here now. Why are we not changing things? Well, I think you have to remember that vote of the profession. And the very difficult thing here is that if you are going to if you are going to level things up, you have two options. Either you take from some to give to others. You know, you take from practices in more affluent areas to bring practices in deprived areas up or you increase the overall money in the system. So you take what I would call a distance to target approach, which was the, is often the approach taken to regional funding allocations in the NHS. And what you do is you say, well, we're going to hold one group steady or, you know, increasing just a bit. And we are going to bring another group up faster. And that, I think, is the approach we have to take here. That 30,000 view foot, uh, foot view of general practice should show you that nobody in general practice is having it easy. General practice does about 90 percent of patient contacts in the NHS for around nine percent of the total budget. We don't spend a huge amount on general practice within the NHS to begin with. So nobody is having it particularly easy. I know the Daily Mail will write about a couple of GPs earning huge salaries, and I think a couple of GPs probably do. But it, you know, we're talking about overall payments into the service here, payments to deliver the, the core services that, that are required in the GP contract. And so what we have to do, I think, is that we have to add a little bit of extra money into the system so we can bring practices in deprived areas up without taking from other practices. And that's where the political will piece of this comes in, because that is fundamentally a political decision. I don't know exactly how much it would cost to do that, um, but from the modelling I've seen, it it's small, small beans in terms of overall NHS budget, likely, you know, hundreds of millions, um, which in, can contrast to, you know, overall NHS system spend, 165, 170 billion um, is not a huge amount of money. Um, but government aren't currently willing to pay. And that is why. Um, my argument is that levelling up is possible, but that we currently lack the political will to do it. In finishing, I just want to say that although I have focused a lot on funding, other things do make a massive difference to these inequities in general practice. Carhill is a big part of the problem, but it's not 
the only solution. So the paper on the left of your screen here is the paper we set out in 2020, which looked at kind of the overall money and workforce. Um, and we then published this time last year, a paper that took a long time to do, because we looked back over 30 years of attempts to tackle the inverse care law in general practice. We looked at everything government said it would do, looked at what government had done and what the outcomes of that were to try and work out, well, OK, you know, what I I, I thought that probably Carhill was one of the things that needed to go. But was I right? We, we wanted to look back and see. And yeah, it was very clear that the thing that really nothing had happened on was funding. But something that things had changed on was workforce, because throughout the early noughties, the then new Labour government had not only a huge focus on tackling health inequalities as a whole, but had quite a focus on tackling inequity in the provision of general practice. So they introduced a policy called equitable access to primary medical care, which was effectively building shiny new health centres in deprived areas and figuring that that would attract GPs, a build it and they will come approach. And the thing is, it kind of works. And it wasn't the only policy. So you can't look at it and say, well, it was exactly that policy that is responsible for all of the change. It was in conjunction with a bunch of other policies at the time. But by the end of that decade, by 2010, 2011, there were more GPs working in deprived areas than in affluent areas. That policy was ended by the incoming Conservative government. It's never been replaced. We have a bunch of sort of smaller, fairly piecemeal policies to try and encourage GP trainees, really. Um, there aren't that many for anyone beyond GP training um, or the first couple of years qualified. We have a bunch of smaller policies. And by 2013, 14, that trend was starting to reverse. And very quickly, we ended up where we are now, which is that there are more GPs working in more affluent areas. So the reason I tell you this is because although where we currently are is a pretty grim place, that is evidence that policy can change the circumstances that we are working in. There were a bunch of policies put in by New Labour in the noughties that did affect the equity of the provision of general practice. So I hope that by now what I have done is to convince you of these three things, that the provision of general practice is inequitable. We won't successfully tackle health inequalities until we level it up, and that levelling up is possible. It just requires political will, and that's not currently there. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you, and I hope that we can now yeah, have a bit of a discussion together. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Beck. That was such an interesting talk, really eye opening and such striking data as well. And I think lessons for all of us here today as well. So thank you very, very much for, for, for such an interesting talk. And um, coming now to questions. So we're hoping this will be a really interactive session. Feel free to raise your hand in the reaction section here on Zoom um, or you can put questions um, in the chat box as well. So I can see one here already from um, Brian Gibbons. Brian, I don't know, would you, what, do you want to unmute and perhaps ask the question or shall I ask that one for you? Uh, well, my name is Brian Gibbons. I worked with Julian Tudor Hart for uh, 20 years and more. And uh, the very question that Rebecca ended with is the perplexing problem of how we haven't been able to reverse the inverse care law after 50 years of trying. Uh, I think that Rebecca has made a very strong case for some of the things that she needs doing. Uh, but I think the point she hasn't probably mentioned is the need to move to a public service, general practitioner service. She said in her own comment there that the GPs voted against a more equitable means of allocating resources. Uh, in other words, that uh, the present independent composition, independent contractor composition of the medical wet workforce, which is a small business workforce, is actually one of the very market forces which were mentioned in the initial inverse care law. So we need to move from uh, GPs working as small business people in that market to a public sector GP service. In other words, directly employed GPs uh, by the NHS. Um, and I think what 
Rebecca has outlined in line with directly employed NHS GPs is probably uh, the best bet we've got to try and reverse the problems graphically outlined. Uh, the resources does mean that the GPs working in those areas do need to have uh, obviously an attractive contract. Uh, in other words, it, it, the hard work that's involved in working in the socially disadvantaged areas is reflected in the remuneration of the contract. But equally, GPs working in those areas do need to be empowered to be effective advocates on behalf of their patients. In other words, to reflect professional autonomy, refashion re the job description to uh, allow GPs to be an advocate on behalf of the patients, not just on their individual level, but collectively as well as part of a wider public health initiative uh, to enable communities and to address the social determinants of ill health. Uh, but very, very grateful to Rebecca. That's an outstanding performance and uh, it needs to be promoted much more widely. Thank you very much. Brian, thank you. That's kind. I'm rather jealous that you got to work with Julian Tudor Hart. Um, I guess I would just reflect that I think there are two, two parts of the funding piece to me. One is the overall proportion of the NHS pie that goes to general practice, which of course I'm going to argue is not enough. And the second is just how you subdivide that pie between practices in, you know, more or less deprived areas and according to population need. And I think that you are right. A challenge that I have when I talk to folk from Treasury is that within the current funding model of general practice, there is certainly a perception, not by everybody in government, I'm sure, but sometimes by some, by a significant enough authority that because of the funding model you will get for the money that you put in. So if you put more money into the service, does it come out as improved health outcomes or does it come out as BMWs for GPs? And that is a very difficult and uncomfortable um, challenge for those of us trying to make the case that the slice of the pie needs to be bigger for general practice. Something I would also add though, is that we are in such a precarious position workforce wise for general practice we need some projections at the health foundation last year looking at sort of and uh, if we stay at current policy scenario we predict that there will be a shortage of one in four gps by 2030 a kind of optimistic scenario would contain that shortage to one in 10 gp posts but a pessimistic scenario which wasn't frankly that pessimistic in terms of the modeling would be a shortage of one in two gps so i think we're also at a point where i also fear a kind of big bang response from government on overall funding models for or business models for general practice that would lead to more GPs quitting in a hurry because we we are so precarious at the moment. Um. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Such an interesting discussion. And um, Peter Roderick, I think you've got your hand up next. Yeah, and thank you so much, Rebecca, for that. Um, absolutely fantastic. A lot of food for thought. Um, I have a question. Um, you, you, you used, uh, I guess, within the presentation, you, you mainly focused, I guess, on in, inter-GP differences in funding, essentially. Your, your, your unit was the general practice, wasn't it? And comparing a yeah. general practice in a deprived area to, a, to, to, to one in a less deprived area. Um, in, in the neck of the woods I'm from, uh, we've had lots of GP mergers. We've got some very large practices, 50, 60,000 sort of populations, essentially meaning that each of our sort of local practices has a huge range of populations who formerly would have been in sort of smaller practices you might have described as in deprived areas who now, I guess from a sort of data point of view, that their needs are masked when the unit is simply a general practice. So, so does that how would we make sure in any formula changes that the sort of intra GP sort of funding, the, the, the work that a single GP might do to tackle inequalities within its own sort of footprint was recognised? Because changing Carhill wouldn't necessarily do that, I presume, because it would be at the level of the single GP. So any thoughts on that sort of that, that, that change, I guess, in size of GP and, and, and the loss of smaller practices, meaning we we lose that 
ability to say whether a general practice is de- in a deprived area or not? Yeah, it's a really, really great question. And I agree it's becoming more and more challenging. I think the overall trajectory will be towards bigger and bigger practices, although at the moment it tends to be smaller practices, predominantly in more deprived areas. Um, a couple of things. Number one is that I don't know what should replace Car Hill. Um, I think that we have, so Car Hill was a formula based on workload. My preference at the moment would be for a needs based population funding formula. So, you know, how do we come up with a formula that adjusts by population health need, both currently met and an estimate of unmet need in a population? Um, and I think that you can probably do that at better area levels than a sort of neat general practice footprint. Um, so I think that part of this is not saying we replace Car Hill with a kind of like with like formula that just slots in IMD, which was the formula review group's recommendation in 2007. I think we can do better than that. Um, or rather, others can do better <laughs> than that, because that was not my area of expertise. Um, and I don't know to what extent we could get around the issues you've just articulated with that. But I think the second point is to say that getting a better needs based funding formula for general practice, I would view as step one. And I think that alongside that have to come a host of different approaches to tackling health inequalities within practice groups. And I think that there are ways that you can do that. So there have been, for example, or were intended to be through PCN contract, through the DES contract, um, the contract for primary care networks, um, an approach to encourage the networks to identify areas of specific health inequality within their own practice patch um, and to resource them to do something about, you know, pick an area and focus on it. I think what I'm stumbling towards is saying, I think there are two things. I think one is that we can do better in terms of formulae, but the second is that that's not the be all and end all. There will be a host of other things that fall out of it. My position and you guys may feel differently. So tell me, I really love to be challenged on this stuff, but I just think it's very difficult to see how we make meaningful progress on health inequality, on work in health inequalities in general practice, whilst there is such inequity in provision. Absolutely. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me as well. And I can see we've got an interesting reflection in the chat there as well from Rawiri Keenan speaking about New Zealand as well, which we can have a think about. And Johnny, I think you've got your hand up. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I've not got my camera on because I'm actually joining from the car after the office shut and uh, booted me out. I have to join on my phone. But um, uh, Bex, that was a really fantastic presentation. And I'm really glad that you commented on the lack of political will within the profession as well as in government because I think that is a huge stumbling block and from conversations we've had about that with colleagues locally in Wales I think we admit that perhaps there's a question we have to look around representation of colleagues in more deprived areas on political committees that I think obviously there's a huge barrier there in terms of the workloads but you know how do we how do we address that but that wasn't the, the main question I wanted to ask actually um I've gathered a little bit that maybe a CCG in Leicestershire or somewhere else um, in England actually looked at redoing their their resource allocation, their funding formula locally yep. and introducing a more needs based approach. I believe it was with a, a, a private data company. I just wonder if you had any observations or reflections on that at all. And if you were, if anything was being done similar elsewhere. Yeah, so it's. LLR, Leicester and Rutland. Um, I think it's LLR. It makes me wonder what the second L is for, but it's Leicester and Rutland um, ICS, which I think covers a relatively small population. They're just over a million. Um, and I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about what I think they did in detail because I will inevitably get it wrong. But you're quite right, Johnny, that what they have done is effectively got rid of Car Hill within their ICS. They use the John Hop- Johns Hopkins ACG system, which is a needs based approach to um funding um and they have adopted that across their ics patch for their gp practices and i think i'm i'm right in saying that they i mean they used basically core ics funding was my understanding to account so they didn't take from practices who would you know so basically they worked out which practices would need to be bought up which was predominantly the practices in the deprived areas 
but they didn't take from practices in affluent areas. They put in some of their total system money. I don't know exactly which pot they chose to take it from. Um, but I do remember because I've spoken to them a couple of times, I was hugely impressed with what they've done, that it was actually a very small amount of their total system spend of the ICS that they had to put in to narrow the gap. Um, and they they did it. And something that I also felt found was very impressive. So they they bought the practices up in deprived in deprived areas up to, you know, parity and beyond. So that was in proportion with need as the intention had been. Um, but they didn't attach, as I understand it, a bunch of strings as to what practices did with that money. Um, and they're now looking very closely at what the outcomes are. But certainly when I last spoke to them, which was before I came out to the US so about six months ago, they felt that it had been a fantastic investment of money. You know, people, the practices had used that money to employ diabetic specialist nurses and do all sorts of things that were clearly going to improve population health outcomes. So, yeah, effectively, LLR have done it. They have got rid of Carhill, adopted a new funding formula. I found it hugely impressive work. If anyone is interested in it and wants to get in touch with me afterwards, I can try and link you up with the folk who did the work. There are a couple of other examples of ICSs. Um, Morecambe Bay have done some interesting work with their population health budget. I'm sure there are more that exist than that I'm aware of, of places saying, look, clearly this is perverse. And local leaders kind of seeing that taking responsible responsibility for it what i would like to see is that mirrored by government but i think having examples of places where it's been done show that you know the need is recognized it is doable and hopefully in a couple of years we will start getting data out from these places and be able to create the evidence around improved outcomes as well Fantastic. Thanks so much, guys. It's so interesting to hear about other ways of approaching it and, and case studies of other, other areas. So thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, as well, for your questions as well. I'll hand over to you, Catherine, now for the last few minutes. Thank you very much. And um, I think so, uh, Peter Roderick has pasted a link in the chat to the LLR work. So people want to follow that up. So anything like that is really interesting. So people are it's the kind of thing that in the SIG we pick up. Um, and I have to say, Bex, it's been a, a really good talk from yourself. Uh, really interesting to see it all put so cogently and coherently together. And then the questions that have come up have been really interesting. So um, if people want to carry on the discussion, um, then join the SIG. Details in the chat. Um, but also what the, the thing I just want to feed back to Bex is that... Um, in terms of collaboration between public health and primary care and general practice in particular, um, we don't seem to be looking at it in the same way. I mean, my population health um, public health colleagues are not thinking strategically about um, the asset that primary care and general practice is as a, a, a way of meeting the needs of the population. We kind of, it's like a blind spot, NHS, particularly primary care, that's not, that's not really included in the debate. So why they're not challenging resource allocation and supporting the, the whole debate about funding, that's a mystery to me. So if anybody's got ideas on how you advocate with population and public health, colleagues because there tends to be this kind of two tribes um and then in the, what i'm seeing in a lot of general practice is like the core 20 plus 5 in england and the population health management it's very reductive and it's not not strategic and looking at things across a bigger population than just very local so i think there's a lot that we could do in carrying on that conversation um across what we can do together better than we can do in our own tribe so um i welcome uh bex as a as a, as a really good advocate advocate across across that patch um i know people have got to go bex has got to go and most people have probably got commitments at six o'clock we've got one minute to go um eleanor uh can uh, I'm happy to um, hand you over the last 30 seconds, but just to say to people, the recording will go on the website so you can all have a look at it again. And please do keep in touch. We'll save the chat as well. Um, Eleanor, did you want to add something? 
No, it's fine. Thank you so much, Bex, for joining us. Um, I, I've just, I've, I, I was aware that the advisory committee on resource allocation were also reviewing and building a needs-based allocation methodology. So I'm not sure how far it's got up to, but um, just to throw that into the pot as well. And of course, a lot of the things that we're asked to do in general practice, again, what <laughs> you're advocating, um, including improving access and um, efficiency and turnover and numbers and so on but anyway thank you so much for joining us really appreciate it's, it it's been a real pleasure thanks so much for inviting me and and thanks so much for being here today everyone well enjoy the rest of your time in san francisco bex and i'm sure you're learning loads lots of lessons positive and negative